to get away with anything. And so you might think you can bend the fabric of reality and that you can treat people instrumentally and that you can bow to the tyrant and violate your conscience without cost. You will pay the piper. It's going to call you out of that slavery into freedom, even if that pulls you into the desert. And we're going to see that there's something else going on here that is far more cosmic and deeper than what you can imagine. The highest ethical spirit to which we're beholden is presented precisely as that spirit that allies itself with the cause of freedom against tyranny. And yeah. Villains to learn before they have to pay the ultimate price? That's such a Christian question. <laughs> When I first heard the argument that it might have come from a lab, I said, no, no, we're not nearly clever enough to design a virus this good. Um, well, once I found out what we were doing, or what they were doing, I was really shocked by how, how far into the manipulation and testing of dangerous viruses we have gone in the last 10 years. I'm trying to understand why there would be motivation to shut down, let's say, speculation, investigation into the possibility of a lab leak. And I guess maybe part of the reason is that it reveals a reality that in some sense is too dreadful to conveniently comprehend. It'd be easier in some sense in the short term just to stick our heads in the sand and pretend it isn't happening. But we also have another problem, which is while the Chinese are pretty damn authoritarian and they're still run by the Communist Party, which is a dreadful organization, we don't know how much our entanglement with the Chinese tilts us towards that totalitarian structure. And so when the pandemic emerged, the totalitarians acted first and they acted in a totalitarian way, which is, well, why don't we just lock everyone down? Which is sort of the totalitarian answer to everything. And then in our herd-like panic in the West, we immediately imitated them. That's the spread of a pathogen too, right? We have a pathogen of, of COVID to contend with, but we also have a pathogen of totalitarian, totalitarianism to contend with. And I would say the latter poses a much bigger threat than the former, unless we keep mucking about with gain of function research. Uh, the bats behind the pandemic. What was it about horseshoe bats that was um, har uh, harboring such viruses? How were people coming into contact with them? What did we know? What was the story in this case? It was a very interesting story in the case of SARS in 2003 uh, to do with food markets near Hong Kong. What was going to be the story in this case? And in investigating it, I came upon anomalies uh, like the fact that this virus was not particularly closely related to the bat one they had, like they couldn't tell me where they found the bat one, the paper that I read didn't give the location, and the name of the virus, the bat virus, uh, was one that didn't appear in the scientific literature, and yet they found, said they'd found it previously. So uh, I was rather puzzled by all this, and I called up a number of virologists, and they said, well, the, yes, there's some anomalies here we don't, we don't understand, but uh, it's nothing to do with a lab leak. You can rule that out. Now, I believed that for about two and a half months, and then I came across the work of Alina Chan, who eventually became my co-author on this book, uh, and she was saying, actually, we can't rule out a lab leak. There's quite a lot of things about this story that make it really quite plausible that what's happened here is, a, is an escape from a lab because we're dealing with a virus that turns up in the city, which has the lab that does work on SARS-like coronaviruses more than any other lab in the world. And that geographical coincidence has to be taken seriously particularly when we find that the virus from the bat that they identified as being closely related to SARS-CoV-2 had been found effectively in their own freezer. Uh, and that's a, a, a starting point for, for a query. So by the middle of May 2020, uh, the Chinese were announcing they didn't think it started in that market. Uh, Alina Chan was saying there's lots of evidence to suggest this thing is well adapted to human beings. And the geographical coincidence all got me interested in 
uh, this being an open question, not a, c- a closed one, and one that needed further investigation. And the deeper I dug, the more emerged. The first smoking pistol, in some sense, as you point out, is the the coincidence of the location of this lab, which studies exactly this kind of virus and the outbreak itself. And that's that's a problem, right? So that means that it's reasonable to look at that and think that, well, it could have escaped from a lab there. That's the first conclusion. And that it has to be demonstrated in some sense that it didn't. And then, so that's a problem. And I can't see how that's anything but an incontrovertible problem. The mere fact that that lab is there and that it does research on those types of viruses and that that's where the outbreak was doesn't prove that it originated in the lab, but it certainly makes that a plausible hypothesis. But then you add this additional twist, which is, I think, more complicated for people to understand, and you detail this out, you, you, you provide some detail for this in the book, that this virus is somewhat remarkably well adapted to human beings. Now, there are literally trillions and trillions of different forms of viruses. And so obviously, most of them aren't particularly well adapted to human beings because otherwise we would have trillions of viruses producing pandemics through all, all the time. So it's generally the case that viruses are not well adapted to transmission in human beings. By the, and that's true for the overwhelming majority of viruses. And so the fact of this human adaptation or adaptation to human transmission is something of signal importance. And so maybe you could walk me and everyone else listening through why a a typical virus isn't adapted to human transmission and what it means that one is and how that develops. The, The normal pattern when a virus first emerges into the human uh, species is for it, be, it to be very difficult for the virus to spread human to human. It can infect someone, it can even possibly kill someone, but they're not very good at passing it on to people. The virus is not really very good at transmitting between uh, members of this new host. Now, if enough time goes by with enough infections happening, then eventually it will get good at it. And that's what was starting to happen with SARS in 2003. Um, uh, it, it, it first infected people in the, in the fall of 2002. Uh, by the spring of 2003, you were starting to see chains of transmission from person to person. Um, and the reason for this is that the virus has to evolve. It has to change its genetic code in such a way that uh, it can uh, uh, better fit the receptors on the cells of humans as opposed to the receptors on the cells of bats or in the case of SARS, the intermediate host, which was a a palm civet. So we should point out that the the problem of transmission that a virus has to solve is no different from the problem of the virus determining in some sense or evolving so that it can live. Transmission in a virus is the same thing as propagation in the environment. And so this is a very naughty problem K-N-O-T-T-Y, for a virus to solve. It's not simple at all because it has to not kill the host too quickly. And it has to be able to replicate within an individual, but then it not only does it have to manage those things, which is very difficult, it also has to figure out how to transmit itself with some degree of effectiveness. And thank God, most viruses can't solve that problem. So this is a very thorny problem. And and you were you're, uh, maybe you can outline for everyone how how viruses do solve that problem and, and why most don't, and why the fact of human, of, of human adaptation to humans is so important. Yeah. A good example, bird flu, which is a, a, a big problem at the moment in poultry flocks and wild birds, um, is not very good at infecting human beings. People can catch it, people have even died of it. Uh, if you're exposed to a huge dose by working in a poultry farm, you can get sick and you'll probably die, but you probably won't give it to anybody else. We've not seen any human-to-human transmission of that virus. 